uh, started with Grand Rounds. So today for our, our first presentation, we're hearing from Dr. Harry. And Dr. Harry is, uh, as, as you all know, works a lot with ultrasounds, and then lately has also been coming to the VA for about the past, how long? We've gone on two years in July. Going on two years, mm -hmm. yeah. And that's, for us as residents, been really nice to, to have a chance to work with Dr. Harry, especially the, the interns work with him. And I know, that it's, I think that's a, a huge advantage to us. So we all really like working with Dr. Harry and really respect him. And today we're going to be hearing about some of his work at um, a juvenile detention center. And then following Dr. Harry, we'll have a second presentation. I'll introduce the speaker at, at that point. So thanks, thanks Brian. You know, we're very fortunate to uh, belong to a very high impact, uh, time intensive uh, profession. You think about ophthalmology, uh, you think of the time spent <coughs> per patient, what we can achieve as far as helping patients see better. Um, and I've thought about this a lot lately. Uh, as I reflected on my, my career, I'm sort of in a transition year this year. I'm going from comprehensive practice into more just strictly ultrasound. And my last surgery day was a couple of weeks ago. And I sort of thought as they did my last case, my last uh, surgery patient, reflected back to 40 years ago when I was first training. And, uh, and these days, we had uh, intracapsular surgery. So we bring the patient to the operating room, we give them retro bulbar, give them lid blocks, we make a big incision, 140 degree incision, uh, and then we go with a cryoprobe, liquid nitrogen, we'd freeze the tip of the probe to the lens, kind of rotate it out, and before that we would put alpha chymotrypsin in to soften the zonules up. And what a paradigm shift. We used to not like zonules, now we love zonules, we treat them with tender loving care, but in those days those pesky zonules, get rid of them so they could get the lens out. We bring the lens out and put Oh, five to ten stitches in to close the eye up. I think my first case took an hour and a half, and finally the next day after surgery, the patient looks like that, aphakic, uh, couldn't really see much because they didn't have a lens in the eye. After about three months, we'd put them in aphakic spectacles. So that was how I trained in surgery. In my last case, two weeks ago, it was 20 minutes, you know, the next day, 20-20 vision on the eye chart. If I could get a time machine and transport a professor that I trained under at, uh, to UCLA and have him sit there and look at that patient, he had no idea what we did. He said, this is magic. Like, there's no stitches in the eye. The patient's saying 20 in the eye chart. You know, what, how did you do this? What miracle did, had occurred? Well, along the way, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of things that had to occur to have that miracle happen. Uh, this was Kohler back in the 1800s who first got the idea about using cocaine anesthesia from a classmate named Sigmund Freud. And that revolutionized eye surgery rapidly. One of those things that just have a high impact. The world was ready for that when he announced this. Within about a year, it was widespread throughout the world. And that became the standard of care to numb the eye with cocaine drops instead of having to hold the patient down and have lightning fast surgery and almost couch the lens to get rid of it. So major innovation. Helmholtz, ophthalmoscope, be able to see inside the eye, see pathology, <coughs> glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy, all these things that we see now so easily couldn't be seen before that time. Then, of course, the innovators, the modern ones, we have Ridley with the intraocular lens. Uh, we have Kelman with FACO, which is standard of care now. Yet, they had to go through a lot to bring these things along. There was a lot of resistance, a lot of uh, derision of them when they first uh, announced this, had to fight the establishment, but finally prevailed. And what we have now with our modern surgery and Mockamer with vitrectomy, I remember it. Uh, days at UCLA with diabetic retina clinic. I used to dread that day because <coughs> diabetics with hemorrhage, uh, anything complication with hemorrhage inside the eye, we had nothing to do. Really, we couldn't, we couldn't get the blood out. There's no way to do it. So we'd say, go to bed for a couple of months, keep your head down, don't move, try to get the blood to settle down. That was our approach to, to, to hemorrhage inside the eye. Now it's just an easy 20 minute procedure with modern vitrectomy techniques that residents can do. So these innovations, these things that have occurred uh, are so amazing. In my, in my career as I reflected back on that first case and last case of surgery. Um, a lot of this translates too to uh, underserved areas of the world. A lot of our modern technology, uh, parts of it we can take with us and do amazing things in countries that don't have access to care. 
We have uh, Randy's vision to be able to see this and to create a department here of international outreach and community outreach. We have uh, boundless energy of uh, Alan and Jeff who lead us in how to go and uh, help people and do things that make such a difference. So we're very privileged to be able to be part of this and see this uh, as part of the residency training program here to have residents have this experience to be able to uh, be part of this and uh, have that planted inside of them. Again, thinking back to my earlier days, this in fact was our residency program at UCLA at Jules Stein back in 1976. Randy was supposed to be there. He was, I guess, out that day, probably doing it at a meeting or something. But anyway, this, this guy here, I did have hair then, uh, more hair and less gray than I have now, but that was our program at UCLA. But uh, it kind of planted the seed for me. Uh, they had an outreach program, both the mobile eye clinic that we used to go on and see local populations. And also as part of senior residents, we would go down to uh, Tegucigalpa, Honduras, the big charity hospital called San Felipe in Tegucigalpa and spend three or four months there as, uh, as senior residents and uh, work at this big eye hospital. And uh, it was quite an experience. I remember as I arrived in Tegucigalpa uh, that same night, the resident that I replaced uh, for the next rotation uh, took me on a tour. We went to the hospital and we went in the ward and saw the eye patients. And there were 20 beds of eye patients and I was taking notes as she was going through each patient. But there were 20 beds but there were 40 patients because they had two patients per bed one head at one end, one head at the other. That was our eye patient ward. And that was, I finally said, well, that's a lot of patients. I was writing out these notes. She said, that's the male ward. Let's go to the female ward. 20 more beds in the female ward with 40 more patients. So <laughs> 80 eye patients in these beds. The next morning was eye clinic. I got there early. They were lined up down the block to get into the clinic. I spoke a little bit of Spanish, not much. And just these barrage of patients just coming and coming and triaging, trying to decide who got surgery, who didn't, uh, what, what to do with them. And the, the price of admission for surgery was a pair of glasses from the hardware store, t plus 10 lenses. They had to go buy a pair of plus 10 lenses for 4 or $5 and a bottle of eye drops. That was how they got into eye surgery. They didn't have that. They couldn't have the surgery, so that was required. And to many patients, that was probably a month's wages or more for them to have that. So anyway, under uh, the International Eye Foundation, their auspices, we went down and did that as senior residents. And uh, that experience of seeing these patients and seeing what can be done even with those earlier techniques, uh, the difference you could make with you know, blind patients, kind of planted that seed in me that uh, has persisted throughout my career. I've had the uh, opportunity many times to go with different groups. I've gone with Orbis, I've gone with C International, LDS Charities, and been able to go to different parts of the world and uh, do teaching, training, uh, working with patients. So that kind of foundation uh, just has been laid as part of my residency training. And that's a neat thing about uh, Moran Eye Center. That's a very strong emphasis as part of the program and uh, being able to have residents have that experience. And it's not just internationally, it's actually even more locally. We have that experience to be able to go here to the reservations. And uh, this picture of Jeff here pulled from the internet. That's a very good likeness of you, Jeff. Very, very nice picture. And I, I saw Jeff in the hall yesterday and just asked about uh, programs in general. My sense is that many ophthalmology programs probably do have outreach kinds of efforts. And Jeff, could you just maybe spend a second and just say what you told me about, uh, about your paper that you've done on that? Yeah, yeah. so our current international fellow, John Welling, he, he developed this sort of rubric where um, he did a survey of uh, all ophthalmology residencies asking specifically about international involvement. And depending on whether they allowed it or not, whether they allowed two weeks or four weeks, whether they financially supported it, and a number of other things, he came up with sort of a ranking with uh, residency programs, uh, uh, based, you know, kind of international outreach uh, efforts or commitment. And Moran was actually, not surprisingly, the clear outlier. I mean, the clear outlier on, on what for us is the good end. Um, it, it's rare in academic programs to have an, an actual outreach division. I don't know if. Um, Michael Yeh can comment on that or not. It, it's, it's incredibly rare for that. Uh, oftentimes a residency may have a free clinic that a resident can go to or sometimes they'll require it, but that typically is the end um, of the involvement. However, there's a massive move over the past 10 years. Um, you know, at least 50% of residency programs are now trying to offer some sort of international ophthalmology opportunity be, for a number of reasons, but one is Residents just want to do it. It's an interest, and they're coming in asking, "How can I do it? Where can I go?" 
and so it's, it's definitely changing. Okay. Any rough I idea? I'll point out too that part of our service we have Jeff Petty literally carrying patients from the doctor. Well, uh, that's right. <laughs> Only he does. Little, little ones. <laughs> <laughs> and Randy, you missed this picture, but I had to show it to you. That's uh, go back in your time machine here. Oops. There we go. Oops. Right here. No, you weren't in there. Somehow you were gone that day. That was our residency picture at Jules Stein back in 76. You remember that? And they had absent members, and you weren't there. You are probably at a meeting or something, You're probably planning, planning the future. But anyway, so. Well, thanks, Jeff, for, for that. And I think that's, you know, a lot of residency programs are, uh, are certainly aware of that and the impact it can have on, on residents. Again, local community, the Moran also is involved with the Fort Street Clinic. I think a lot of you have, been, have done that. The Malahay Clinic, kind of the working poor, these kinds of efforts to reach out locally and to, uh, to help people. Uh, have the uh, Operation Site Day, um, where uh, we have free surgery several, several times a year and many people involved in that. So um, a lot of opportunities to serve. And I know even in general practice, I know sometimes young ophthalmologists, they first start in practice, it's kind of hard to take off on these trips. You know, you gotta try to build a practice, you have a young family to take the time. But the neat thing about our specialty is you can do things just on a daily basis in your office. I mean, patients without insurance, you know, that you can help. Uh, the Academy of Ophthalmology has the uh, Eye Care America program. You sign up for that and you commit to a certain number of patients per year that you'll see that uh, can't pay. Uh, Health Access, the Salt Lake County Medical Society has a program similar to that where you agree to see certain patients uh, per year. So just many opportunities for us to do that. And that's the, the thing about our specialty, we can do that almost on a daily basis and be able to have this opportunity to, to help and to, to be part of that. Well, this leads up to what I'm talking about today. This is the Salt Lake County Youth Detention Center. This is about uh, 9th West and 34th South. It's down by the, right across from the jail. This is for young people, uh, kind of 12 to 18 years old, if they uh, commit a crime and they're picked up, this is where they're taken immediately. So if you're reading the paper about somebody that was involved in a crime, they're often not named because of laws about juveniles, but they're taken to this facility and they're placed there. And this is kind of a triage holding facility that I've been involved with for a number of years. It's actually through a church assignment that we were actually called down there initially to help these kids with kind of spiritual principles and life skill, uh, life skill uh, things. But while being there, I realized how many of these kids can't see very well. As I taught classes, I would see them squinting and they couldn't read the words on the board. So I kind of got the idea to maybe do some visual screening while I was down there and um, just kind of set a program to do that. Just a bit about the detention center. Uh, this provides, uh, again, short-term uh, lockdown for kids. So they're picked up for a crime, they're taken there uh, night or day, any time of the, of, the, of the day, and they're placed into a holding facility. And they have eight different units. They have six boys' units and two girls' units, and each unit has a number of rooms inside with secure doors, and it's a triple lockdown facility. As you go in the front, you go through a three lockdown uh, facility, and there's a control tower to kind of direct all that, that uh, traffic. But, um, these kids, this is a typical uh, room that the kids are in, very stripped down, very, very basic, and they have to watch these kids. There's sometimes suicide attempts and other self-harm things. They have to kind of keep, really, uh, keep a close eye on them. Uh, the statewide admission guidelines uh, uh, are what are, are the reason the kids are sent there. A juvenile judge has the ability to sentence a, a kid to, to go there or to uh, stay there for a certain length of time. And these are offenses these kids commit, uh, so it's much more than just shoplifting or smoking a joint. These are major crimes, and these kids are just amazing sometimes. Uh, to look at these kids, they seem so innocent, so young, one-on-one, -on -one, but yet there's some pretty terrible crimes that are committed. And uh, it's often just poor choices, you know, kids that are impulsive and very bad home situations and the reasons for this, but still there's some pretty serious stuff going on out there, and uh, this, uh, uh, these kids are sent here for these reasons. They uh, are uh, entitled to hearings uh, when they're first placed there. Uh, they have, within 48 hours, they have to have a hearing. There's kind of a room with a closed circuit uh, television that uh, a juvenile court judge can actually see the kids without having to come to court when they first get there to determine uh, how severe the crime was, uh, what the deposition is gonna be, if they're gonna stay there for a while, they're gonna go to another program, go to 
long-term lockdown, different things. This is Judge Valdez, one of the famous uh, juvenile court justices that just retired a year or so ago, and uh, he has quite a history. He himself, as a child, grew up in kind of a poor area of the city, and sold newspapers, ran around, got close to gang activity, but he turned it around. He had a mentor that sort of uh, singled him out and started working with him, taught him how to play tennis, taught him how to work in school. He actually got a tennis scholarship to the U and went to law school at the U uh, on a tennis scholarship. So, and he uh, became a juvenile court judge, so he can relate to these kids and uh, empathize with them and uh, you know, counsel them and advise them about things to do to, to help them improve their lives. Uh, some kids aren't placed in this facility uh, for different reasons. If they're runaways or uh, truancy issues, things like that, uh, they're placed in other facilities. They have foster care, they have uh, group homes, they have proctor homes and other things that these kids can be put in uh, that don't uh, require a lockdown. There was a story in the paper recently about an eight-year-old boy that was dropped off at a hospital just by the mother because she couldn't handle him, so she just kind of dumped him there in the front door of the hospital. They didn't know what to do with him. They, like, they placed him in, I think, a a proctor home, but uh, there are facilities that kids can go to that don't require being locked down in this facility. Uh, they can also be confined to home confinement, uh, and they monitored there, again, feeling at the level of danger to themselves and to society. Well, while I was there, I just sort of, uh, out of curiosity, wondered about the number of kids here versus uh, outside detention that had refractive errors. Again, I've seen these kids. We began this program of screening kids. We have an auto-refractor, a handheld uh, auto-refractor that we go around and check their eyes with. And uh, we have different uh, 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 powers of glasses. I used to try to order glasses and get into the kids, but these kids are so transient that they come and go so fast. By the time I got the glasses made and went back, they were gone somewhere and I couldn't track them down. So I just go to uh, zinni.com. I'm their best customer and I order many glasses uh, a month, different powers, different strengths. I just take those with me. I have, I have little boxes of glasses. I pull them around and we uh, can, right there on the spot, we can fit glasses on these kids. So that's worked uh, the best. Some kids that we can't fit, we do try to get glasses for other sources, but uh, it is a problem with their, their transiency. So worldwide, refractive error is actually the largest cause of visual impairment in the world. And we always think of cataracts, glaucoma, the more dramatic things, but actually simple refractive errors really are a major cause of disability. And many countries can't really afford glasses. Uh, estimating almost a billion people uh, don't have access to corrective lenses, something as simple as a pair of, uh, of readers to be able to read after you're presbyopic. Uh, visual disorders are the fourth most common disability of children and the leading cause of handicapping conditions in childhood. So it's a really, it's a big problem among kids. And we, again, we think of third world, think of developing countries, but right here in Salt Lake City, we have kids that don't have access to glasses that uh, could really be helped by them. As I looked at different studies, uh, the numbers around 20% or so in different countries, more developed countries, you get more remote areas, you get higher incidences, India as high as 50%, Asia probably that, that is higher, higher. United States studies showed around 15% by the end of grade school that need glasses for myopia. So the study that we did, we looked at uh, over two years, uh, about 1,600 kids that were screened, um, and we gave uh, glasses to 569 of these kids and re referred 22 of them for problems such as amblyopia or other problems that couldn't be corrected by glasses. One of our techs from the Moran that uh, helps me out, we have about six of them that rotate on uh, every week and go with me and help screen these kids. So we simply check their uh, vision on an eye chart. We have charts in each unit and have them read the eye chart. And just based on that, we sort of do an initial triage screening that they can't see better than 2040. We'll then auto refract them and then determine the refractive error from that. If they're 2040 or better, then we usually don't unless there's some major problem they really said they can't see. And I compared this to a junior high school population. I got some numbers from the PTA that does a lot of the screening for kids in junior highs. So I tried to get a kind of a comparable population and uh, determined from that that uh, almost 400 had refractive errors, uh, enough to require glasses for, so about 22% of these kids. So if you compare the numbers in the DD population, 34% uh, need glasses or refractive errors, enough to uh, merit getting glasses. 
compared to the junior high school population, about half, uh, just almost half that. So a very significant p-value and odds ratio, uh, obviously very different in these two populations. So my techs, again, that go around with me, you probably work with some of these, uh, Marcella and Riley and Marissa and Elizabeth, that are, they're helping me out. So very, uh, very faithful in doing that. And every week they just take turns and come and make the rounds with me and see these kids and give glasses to them. Uh, types of refractive error, we saw a lot of variation. Uh, anisotropia, astigmatism, again, these require special glasses. We have to special order, so that's always kind of a challenge, but we do the best we can. But these are glasses that we give. We can give to kids right uh, on the spot. And amazingly, I've had kids as high as minus nine, minus eight, that never had glasses or contacts. Imagine a 16-year-old, just how does that happen? Well, often it's, you know, dad's in prison, mom's on drugs, brother's in a gang, they're foster cares, homeless, bounced around, they just don't get, they just fall through the cracks in the social net. So. Right here in Salt Lake City, we got this kind of a problem. We got, you know, minus nine. How blind can that be? That's, that's worse than sometimes a dense cataract. So, anyway, it shows the every around us, everywhere. There's a chance to help and to serve, to use our skills and knowledge to be able to help people. And again, the auto refractor. We just use this Nikon unit that works quite well and able to determine refractive errors. Also, just as a side interest, I I kind of wondered the correlation between um, visual acuity on the eye chart and refractive error. Does a minus one always mean 2040? Does it mean 2050? What actually does it mean? And there, actually, there's quite a spread. I just kind of did a little graph of this just to show there's a lot of variance. The 2040 can be minus one, minus 125, uh, even up to 2050. So there's a lot of up and down. So one person's minus one could be 2040, another person's can be uh, minus 150. So it's funny how the visual system is not just the eyes and the refractive error, it's other perception issues that uh, make your vision uh, uh, worse or better than it, than it really is. It's pretty obvious, this isn't uh, rocket science, but when kids don't see very well, they don't do very well in school. And I think that's part of the problem um, in this uh, population, that there are a lot of challenges for them, of course. They have a lot going against them with their home situations. But school performance, I always ask about that as I give glasses. I say, okay, now we're going to give glasses to you. What are you going to do? What are you going to pay back uh, for the glasses? And I, they say, well, uh, try to do better. I say, well, do better in what? And I always stress school. I say, what grade are you in? What grade in school? Well, I think eighth grade, I'm not sure, because a lot of them don't go to school. You know, they haven't gone for a while. The DT does try to provide that. They actually have uh, a school during the day. They have school teachers from the district that come in and provide school. But a lot of these kids are transient again. They're there for a short time. They go somewhere else. So school is really tough for these kids. But if they can do better, I stress that. That's your one key to the future is to do better in school and try to you know, focus on school. And these glasses will help you do that. And they really they, they understand that. They can see better. They appreciate that. And I challenge them to use those glasses to try to do better and make better choices. So hopefully it sticks. And it's hard to get follow up. We don't have the resources to really follow these kids. I, I'm guessing about maybe. 80% uh, do keep their glasses and do use them and take care of them, but about 20% probably don't. They just uh, uh, just kind of a transient thing with them, and they, they don't uh, take care of them. So again, Helen Keller, I started with a quote from her, and I like this quote. Although the world is full of suffering, it's also full of the overcoming of it. And again, we have this unique privilege of being ophthalmologists, this incredible specialty, just what the impact we can have just from a simple pair of glasses to you know, advanced uh, surgery, vitrectomy, or cataract surgery, being able to help. Um, all of us probably have friends that want to help. They say, can I go on a campaign with you? Can I do this? But you know, we say, well, I'm sorry, we can't. You, really, you need special skills to do this. You know, the things that we do really can't translate to the general lay population. They want to help. They just don't see a way to do that. But, we have that unique, unique uh, uh, gift. So I'm just very appreciative of that. Again, this part of my career, I'm sort of phasing out that part of it, um, being able to look back and see the changes that have occurred, the, the, the uh, progress, the innovations, the pioneers that have uh, laid the ground for us. So anyway, it's just a humbling, uh, very appreciative uh, sense that I have of what I've been able to do. So anyway, thank you for that, uh, that privilege. Um, I've asked a few residents to at least send a thing out about uh, any residents that have had experience uh, in an outreach program to share just a brief experience or how it impacted them. 
Anybody have a chance to think about that? And Julia, for personally for you for the future, has that done anything for you? Has that impacted you? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? So I, yeah. I just, it, it's interesting as you talk about this problem of not wearing glasses. And, and uh, the other side, though, that I, that I personally could relate is the, uh, uh, the stigma sometimes associated with glasses. So um, I, before I had LASIK, a lot of you, you remember me, Roger, when I had pretty thick glasses, I was quite excited. And, and uh, in high school, uh, I always, I always had a reputation of a little dorky enough. They made me look dorky, so I go around without glasses. And uh, I know I was legally blind, and uh, and, and I sense related to people. They said you were so stuck up in high school because you wouldn't walk by and wave. I didn't wave because I didn't know who the heck I was seeing. Right. <laughs> so so uh, it, it is it is interesting that we may provide them, but but uh, and, uh, I can think of a fair number I know who, you know who, who wouldn't wear them. Just we got to think about that. If they're not if they're not using them, then they're still essentially legally blind in what they're doing and where they are. And then the other one is is that uh, there's some interesting new work that just come along about uh, the incredible increase of myopization, which is which is uh, considered part of uh, people <coughs> so involved in not being outside and outdoors and so involved in video gaming and, and smartphones and the rest. And, uh, and some evidence that, that we're, we're about ready to see uh, a tsunami change, in both of, uh, of myopia, but particularly of pathological myopia. So <coughs> both of you were just training, I think you're going to see a lot more than we did. And uh, um, even to the point now where they're starting to recommend the kids at least should go outside one hour, you know, try to get them outside one hour a day, because that seems to correlate. But there's a big body of information on this, just sitting on the video game all the time. And the societies that have done that, where where there are some groups now where their where their you know myopia rate by the age of 15 is getting up to 80 percent. Right, Asian populations especially, yeah, yeah. Mm, yeah. And, that, and that's what it correlates with. Now, atropine. I know at one point, actually, you did a paper on that years ago. I think you did with one of the local doctors here about atropine. Does that anything come with that? Does so, that... Uh, the latest is a study that came out of Singapore. Uh, and uh, actually, the first serious long-term longitudinal study looking at, at uh, myopia prevention with atropine is a paper that uh, uh, we published from an with an ophthalmologist uh, up out of uh, Ogden that, that came out of here. Oh my gosh, 25 mm -hmm. years ago. And uh, the latest is is that you can avoid a lot of the side effects by going down to a dose of 0.01 percent atropine. Yet still have some prevention of the uh, axial elongation, and uh, uh, there's debate about whether or not that should be a routine. That if, if you're showing a myopia progression or coming on an early age, the kids should be routinely be put on that, and uh, uh, that's a big battle inside the field. But I, I wouldn't. The data looks pretty good. I wouldn't be surprised if we're going to start actually. That's if if they're showing that myo myopic progression is coming on early. That work that, and, and that there's going to be a product out there that's going to be a very low dose atropine used once a day for those people. So uh, it's a pretty good study. Look, it's a Singapore. Just mm -hmm. I don't know. If, yeah, it did finally come out in print, but it just was a recent one in which they showed you could get a lot of the effect 
but uh, not many of the side effects of that very well. Right. You think the Asian populations with such a high incidence might that might be a major thing that they they consider doing too? So. But they have societies there in which uh, people were uh, largely looking at distance, uh, where a lot of people were illiterate, not messed up reading, in which none of them, you know, are nearsighted, and then their kids who all have smartphones and the rest mm -hmm. in some of the rural areas of China, and ninety percent of rates of myopia. Right. Right. So clearly, the correlation is very strong. Genetic predisposition obviously varies from place to place, but but the feeling is is that. This, this idea that you don't go outside and you video game all the time is, is just really starting to become a pretty important player and actor throughout the civilized world. And that we're just beginning to see a tip of a huge change of this problem where it's, it's going to become predominant. Yeah. So many people are going to be Exactly. Yep. Do you okay. get that with atropine through lighters or other cognitive forms of the lighters? To the low, the low dose, you can get real low there concentration. Was a count, counterpoint recently, and they're talking about getting an editorial, I know, and an AGO and, and about this, about where we are. But I mean, it is, they're still controversial, those, they're not, but I, I think the evidence is strong enough. I think it'll become, I predict within five to 10 years, this will be standard practice of care. Okay. Question, yeah. Um, so about your comment that it's hard to get follow-up after this intervention. Mm -hmm. Um, I wonder, and have wondered for quite a long time, if, if as a result of the intervention that you and that Dr. Olson have also discussed here, if it were, if one could get follow up, and it may be hard, but I don't think it's impossible, if we would then see a decrease in future criminal activity because of these interventions. Mm -hmm. We're actually doing kind of a sub-study now in the same population. We're looking, first of all, at racial uh, tendencies towards uh, refractive errors, and also crime, violent crime versus less violent, if there's a correlation to that with degree of refractive error, and then follow up with that maybe to see if it makes an impact. So that's a very good point. That would be a long-term study and require some effort, but I think that's, that's doable. So I agree. That makes a difference, hopefully. I know I, I was called in one time. I was like Sunday night. They called me from the DT and said, I got, could you come down? I said, okay. There's a kid transferred from California. He was like 12 years old just totally out of control, just combative, fighting, just couldn't handle it. I had to put him in an isolation cell. So I came down and they th got the sense he couldn't see very well. That's part of the problem. So I refracted him, you know, minus seven and a half or something, no glasses. So I gave him a pair and like, it was like Valium. It just calmed him down. Like he immediately could, you know, he was, he calmed down. He could go back in the general population because he was combative because he couldn't see. He was afraid of being attacked from the side. He couldn't see what was coming at him. So, you know, that's an example of just, you know, what it can do to somebody that's kind of out of control, just to be able to see better when they can't focus, they can't see, they're afraid, they're scared, don't know what's coming. So, any more questions or comments? Okay, thank you. <laughs>